Welcome back in Alive Now from Fox. I'm Austin Westfall. Let's get into the latest on the Israel-Hamas war. And for that, we're joined by Dr. Alone Burstein, a US, uh, UCI visiting assistant professor and Israel Institute fellow. As always, Alone, good to see you. Let's get straight into the news here. President Joe Biden is going to be announcing in his State of the Union speech that the U.S. military will construct a temporary port on Gaza's Mediterranean coast to receive humanitarian aid by sea, according to senior administration officials. Planning for the operation, initially based on the island of Cyprus, does not envision the deployment of U.S. military personnel in Gaza, the officials told a news briefing. Um, alone, if this does in fact end up being Biden's big talking point related to Israel tonight, what does it say to you that, of all things, Gaza aid is a point of focus? We're not seeing initial reports alluding to extra support for Israel's offensive. First of all, good to see you as always. Um, really what we're, we've been seeing in the last several weeks, one could almost say last several months, basically since the beginning of January, is a growing collision between Israel and the United States with regards to where the war is going. The United States wanted Israel to lay down its plans regarding for the future of Gaza and basically to explain why Israel is carrying out the military operation the way it is and if Israel could come up with, because this is our plan for the future, this is how Gaza is going to look, and this is how it's going to be administered, this is what's going to happen to the Palestinian civilians, et cetera, then the U.S., according to at least U.S. sources, may have been able to be more supportive, may have been able to say, okay, therefore we'll continue to give you the quote-unquote blank check no matter what you do. Since Israel's not really come up with a plan, and this is a result of internal Israeli politics, Netanyahu is bound by his right-wing coalition and other for forces and factors, between that and the growing humanitarian disaster in the northern parts of the Gaza Strip, which we spoke about yesterday, that has been really become acute in the last several weeks, the United States is starting to say, okay, right now, Israel is going to maybe invade Rafah, maybe not, but the U.S. is trying to actually put, put the brakes on that. And meanwhile, trying to address the humanitarian situation. And there is a lot of signaling being done to Israel here. The fact that the U.S. has been para-dropping aid into Gaza is almost a slap in the face to Israel to say, okay, you're running the war, you're not doing a good job. You're not doing a good job. We, we, we're giving you the diplomatic support that you need. We can't do that if people are starving. So that the U.S. has to come and drop aid into Gaza is, was already the U.S. stating, Israel, you're not doing a good enough job as far as we're concerned in managing the situation, so we're stepping in. And now, according to reports today in Israel, Israel was surprised at the, that the U.S. is making this announcement. Israel knew that the U.S. was talking about this, but this is not being coordinated. It's part of the breakdown that's been really building in the last several months between Israel and the United States regarding how the war is going, what is the future, what's the plan for Gaza? This is really the manifestation of it. We talk so much about Bibi Netanyahu, Yahya Sinwar, so many of the big players in the Middle East, but let's remind our audience, why is it that the U.S. president's words are so important? Why is it that so many people in the Middle East are going to be watching the State of the Union closely tonight? So, I mean, we go back historically, right, to, you know, the uh, positions during the Cold War, et cetera. But if we look really at the last 20 years, the United States is not only one of the most important players in terms of its interests in, this, in, in the region, in terms of its interests in oil with Saudi Arabia, its interests in regional allies in terms of Egypt and what was going to be maybe Iraq, um, if Iraq had gone a different way after, after the invasion and things like that, uh, against Iran in order to curtail Iran. So first of all, the U.S. has a lot of interests, and that's one of the reasons that it pours a lot of effort into this region. Then there is the situation with Israel. The United States is a constant supporter of Israel, and while this is often belittled by a lot of different elements in Israel and the right, in the United States, some elements sometimes in the Republican Party, the elements of the Democratic Party used to belittle it, now they more echo it and say the United States should not be as supportive necessarily. The, the fact is that not, this is not only some up, come up to aid packages and the cash value of armaments the United States gives Israel. The United States is the only actor that protects Israel diplomatically. Israel, for a lot of reasons, a lot of them are, you know, quote-unquote, unfair. Israel is the most condemned country in the United Nations. Israel is the country that's, that has the most sanctions that people try to impose on it. But all sanctions, all of that can only amount to anything if it goes through the Security Council, and the United States is a constant veto against that. The United States is a major player in this, and the truth is, while it seems that the UN is this body that doesn't really function, if, in fact, the U.S. would not block all these sanctions against Israel, it would be a major blow to Israel. International sanctions would mean that Israel could not, it, it could be cut off from the SWIFT system. That's one of the proposals that was made. Its, its economy could, could tank. So the U.S. really is a major player in the way the, the region in the Middle East develops, and specifically in the way 
Israel's managing its war without the U.S. support, Israel would not be able to manage the war the way it does. And therefore, if the U.S. is signaling to Israel, we're getting tired of the way things are run, Israel can make a lot of statements. And now today said, we're going to continue the invasion of Rafah when we want to do it no matter what. Realistically, that actually bears a hell of a lot of weight with how things develop in the Middle East. Let's talk about the West Bank for a moment. The Jerusalem Post says that Germany is calling on the Israeli government to immediately withdraw the approval of further settlements in the West Bank, saying that building settlements in the Palestinian territories was a serious violation of international law. Right now, you're looking at a statement from the UN's special coordinator for the Middle East peace process. He's calling for Israel to cease, quote, provocative actions. Um, alone, d does this settlement seem provocative? It certainly comes at a provocative time. You know, the, the settlement project in the West Bank that used to be in the Gaza Strip is Israel's biggest source of controversy when it comes to its relations with the United States, with the UN, with its position in the world. Now, by international law, the settlements are de facto illegal. There's no way around that. According to the international law, you're not allowed to build settlements and resettle your own citizens in an occupied territory. Israel has claimed that that should not apply to the West Bank because it's not really occupied because of a lot of things. Again, we can go into the nuances, but as far as the world is concerned, it's a clear and shut case. Settlements are illegal. And therefore, even if Israel thinks that that is not the case, the settlements are not illegal, announcing the development of 3,400, almost 3,500 housing units and settlements at the current point when the war is going on in Gaza, when the world is concerned that Israel is going to develop settlements in Gaza, when key ministers in Israel's cabinet are in fact saying that Israel is going to develop settlements in Gaza, and Prime Minister Netanyahu is saying that's not going to happen, but that's concerning the world, at that moment, to announce that you're developing thousands more units in the West Bank is in fact somewhat of a slap in the face to saying, we don't care what the, what, what the world thinks. And again, I'm, not, I'm trying to avoid judgment on whether it is illegal or illegal. I'm just saying the fact of the way the, the country sees itself and operates vis-a-vis -vis the world, the world sees this obviously as not only an obstacle for peace, not only something that harms the Palestinians, but as something that violates international law. And while Israel is defending itself in the International Court of Justice saying in Gaza, it is abiding by international law to at that same time do this in the West Bank, doesn't sit well with the world and doesn't sit well with the relationship with the world. And I don't know if Biden's gonna specifically address this in the State of the Union tonight, but I could tell you that I pretty much guarantee that in the U.S. administration, they are probably livid at this because, again, the, the Biden administration is going to face questions. So you agree that this is wrong. So what are you doing about it? You do have the ability to pressure Israel. What are you doing about it? It just comes at a very inconvenient time for Israel's friends at this moment. Another historic question. Why, why does the land have to be specifically for one group only? Why can't the settlements be classified for anyone? So there's a couple of different, there's a couple of different things, but essentially... In 1967, when Israel took over the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, they were not annexed to Israel. So Palestinians that live there have no civil rights. They are not citizens of the country. They are under martial law. However, settlements, when, when they are built in these territories, they are for Israeli citizens. They're for Israeli citizens, exclusively Jews at that point because of other regulations. And so they enjoy civil liberties. For example, when there's elections in Israel, there are election, election stalls in and booths in settlements and in the next hill over, there are people who are living under martial law with no civil liberties. So you really, it, it, the settlements are not put there in order to try to enrich the land or the territory. There are two different systems that are operating concurrently in the West Bank. It used to be also in the Gaza Strip, where settlers do have complete civil liberties and civil rights, and Palestinians do not. That is the source of controversy as far, and as far as the world is concerned, right, it's an open and shut case. Like I said, that's where it ends. You, it doesn't matter that Israel argues that because this territory was not owned legally by Jordan or Egypt when they took it over, so it's not occupied. Those are legalistic arguments that the world says, yes, but de facto on the ground, you have one group of citizen, of people who have citizenship and civil rights and another group that does not. And again, like I say, Israel knows this and whether it agrees with that or does not agree with that, to be advancing this now is very, very poor strategy. And again, like I often say, the only reason that that's happening is internal politics. In Israel, Netanyahu has an extreme right-wing government. There have been several terror attacks by Palestinians against Israelis and Israeli settlers. And the hawkish elements in government, Itamar Ben-Gvir, Bitsalel Smotrich, all told Netanyahu what has to happen now 
as sort of a slap in the face back to Palestinians is there are terror attacks, we're going to build more settlements. And the fact that this looks bad internationally, they're not factoring in at that moment, which I think is going to be to Israel's detriment as it relies more and more on the U.S. support if it does carry out this invasion of Rafah, especially if that happens during the month of Ramadan, Israel's going to need a lot of diplomatic cover from the United States. And I think this comes at a very poor time for Israel strategically. Last thing I want to hit on before we go here, Bloomberg reports that the anchor of a cargo ship sunk by Houthi militants was probably responsible for damaging three telecommu uh, telecommunications cables in the Red Sea in late February, according to assessments by the U.S. and an industry group. Um, okay, alone. So we had previously discussed the possibility of the Houthis purposefully targeting these cables. This report now makes it seem as if it was the Houthis' fault, but maybe not as purposeful as we had thought. Nonetheless, does, does that likely change how the world assesses what happened here? Those cables are pretty important. So like, like we talked about before, um, I did not think that it was the Houthis already then, or at least deliberately, because it just doesn't make sense for a group to, on the one hand, do something that actually affects the entire world in terms of the economy, in terms of politics, but then say, actually, we didn't do that. Then th th there would be no sense in doing that. So the fact that it is you know, ultimately their fault, look, the entire situation that's, the, that's been developing in the Red Sea is the Houthis' fault, right? They're firing at ships as they go by. So the fact that this also is their fault, you know, is not surprising. Um, I doubt that this is actually going to have a lot of ramifications in terms of the world's response, because like we've seen, the world has sort of accepted that the Houthis are doing this right now, right? No one's thinking, let's go invade Yemen to stop them. They're, they're, we're sending defensive coalitions that are carrying out more low-level attacks to try to convince the Houthis to sort of stop their attacks, but not actually doing anything that's going to, you know, initiate a war with Yemen. And so what we're seeing here is actually the world now has an excuse, but don't you see that the Houthis escalated to the point that they are now actually damaging the entire world economy? They're taking down the world's telecommunication systems? No, the, the, the Houthis still played by, quote-unquote, the rules of the game. They attacked the ship. And that ship ended up causing that. So I don't think that this is going to cause the escalation that maybe it would have caused if it would have been a deliberate act of the Houthis. But what we are seeing, I will say, in the last couple of days is that the situation is escalating. The Houthis have been attacking more ships. They have been attacking ships that then they said belonged to the United States that didn't belong to the United States. The fact that they're not being careful about who they attack means that they're getting more emboldened, means that they're feeling we can actually cripple the world's economy and do it in a way that influences the world on the one end and not suffer a lot of consequences on the other. So we are seeing that there's an escalation. It's likely going to continue in the coming days. Um, but I don't think this cable incident specifically is going to be sort of the spark that now launches something new. We've got to leave it there for now alone. We will be watching the State of the Union closely, and we always look forward to your daily YouTube uploads about the war as well. Take care. Thank you. Have a good day.